So as the last few people are getting settled, um, let me say welcome. I'm assuming most of you, maybe not all, but most of you are members of Caledonia Christian Reformed Church. And if so, that means uh, you know where you are and you're comfortable where you are and you know who I am. My name again is Jeff Wyma. I'm a professor of New Testament at, at Calvin Theological Seminary. And um, I do a lot of preaching, but this is kind of like a Bible study. And uh, I've got a little series, uh, four weeks. So it has to do with Paul. So last week, a few of us were here then, and we talked about Paul the man, kind of personalizing the apostle. So he's not just a name, but he's more of a character, a figure, and I might almost say to humanize him a little bit, uh, and, and I hope that that happened last week. This week, we're talking about Paul the missionary, about a, a big focus of his life, his passion for sharing the gospel. And then next week and the week after that, because, um, well, all of these topics are big and complex and we could go on for a while, but next week I want to talk about Paul, the letter writer. And this has to do with the very skillful and um, calculating way in which Paul writes his letters. And because our time is short, we're going to look at a short letter, namely Philemon. And so um, next week and the week after that, uh, I'd like to kind of march through that little letter and uh, impress upon you the uh, persuasive skills of the Apostle Paul. So that's what we're doing in this series. And uh, tonight we're week two of four. And I've just about stalled enough for the last people to get settled, right? And before we turn to Paul the missionary, then I'd like to invite you to join me in a prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. It's a simple message that some of us have heard for a long, long time, but it's an amazing message, a message of your incredible love for us, demonstrated very powerfully in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for allowing us not only to know that gospel story, but to be participants in it, that you have called us to be your sons and daughters, to be part of the family of God. And now, Part of our spiritual family has gathered here tonight, O oh God, and they have done so out of an interest to learn more about your word, and tonight especially a person who was influential in revealing your will, a person through whom you work to spread the good news of the gospel. And so we pray that your spirit, the Holy Spirit, will be present in such a way that while well, we will understand not only the biblical text in new and fresh ways, but also understand its implications for us as we begin this new week of service in your church and kingdom. So bless our time together, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Paul, the missionary. Now, the Apostle Paul has maybe one verse that, that really kind of strikes me if you want to get into the, the kind of basic core of this overwhelming desire he had to spread the gospel. He says to me, uh, to us in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach the gospel. And in this line, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul had a very strong sense that something bad would happen to him. God had called him to this special purpose, and if he didn't kind of accept that call, well, woe to him. And um, when we get seminary students... This is a verse that I think all of them should also feel the need to say because I don't know what you think about preaching, whether you think it's easy or hard, but um, it's not as easy as it looks and um, I have a big surprise for you. Not everybody loves what you say when you preach, right? Okay, that there are people who complain, right? You're either boring or they think you're wrong or whatever the case may be and what, what do you need to keep on coming to the pulpit? What do you need when opposition comes your way, right? Uh, and opposition will come your way, not just if you're a preacher, but if you share the good news of the gospel with anyone. Well, you need this 
this powerful sense that, you know, woe to me unless I preach the gospel. And so if you want to understand the Apostle Paul, if you want to understand the reason why he suffered so much that he did, if you want to understand why he traveled thousands and thousands of miles in all kinds of difficult situations, it's because he had this overwhelming conviction that God had called him to be a proclaimer of this good news that we call the gospel. Now, last week already, uh, I introduced this point, so I apologize for those who were here last week, but this is a new point that actually not many people know about, and so maybe it's worth going over briefly again, and that's this point. Many of us, uh, throughout our Bible journey, either at church or at maybe Christian school or adult education or whatever, we've learned about the so-called missionary journeys of Paul. First missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey. And those names are actually a bit inappropriate. They're a bit misleading because the first point, the point again I made last week is Paul was involved in missions already for a long time before he began what we wrongly call now the first missionary journey. So the first point I want to make is, and and look at the years again over there, if you subtract 47 from 33, you end up with 14. And so there were 14 years between the time that Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he began what we're going to see in just a few minutes, after I get through this part, the so-called first missionary journey. So I want to impress upon you that Paul is not a baby Christian when he first starts preaching the gospel, right? He's been a believer for some time. And what's more, he's, he's got some practice, right? He, he, he must have been out there sharing the good news for 14 years. And it's helpful to think of those 14 years as three plus 10 plus one, three plus 10 plus one, very quickly. Three years in Arabia. And last week we talked about Arabia does not mean the desert all by himself meditating on this encounter with Christ. But Arabia involves the city of Damascus, where Paul clearly was already involved in missionary activity. It involves uh, cities like Petra, pretty cool and impressive places. And and we don't know, of course, where Paul was, but certainly during this three-year period already, after he met Jesus, when Paul was in Arabia, he was involved in preaching and a missionary activity. And then he went to Jerusalem after becoming a Jesus follower, and he causes controversy. We don't don't know what he was doing, but he was probably preaching the gospel. And again, there was opposition, so much opposition that the other disciples were like, whoa, Paul, I mean, we're glad you're on our team now, right? We're glad you're a Jesus follower like we are, but things are pretty hot with you around, and we just want to put you on a boat and send you somewhere, send you to the city of Tarsus. And people who were last year will say that makes perfect sense because, of course, they're sending him back home. That's right. That's where he came from. And then Paul was at least 10 years in Tarsus, 10 years in the province of Cilicia over here. There it is, right? And, and we really don't know what Paul was doing. But we do know that he was involved in missions. First of all, we know that just from his character and the work that he did beforehand. But we also know that because there are just a couple of references, not many, Not enough, really, but a couple of references in Acts that says that when Paul went through this region later on, there were already churches there. There were already churches in, for instance, Cilicia. And so where did those churches come from? Well, a logical conclusion is they must be churches that were the result of some activity of Paul during those 10 lost years, lost in the sense that we don't know what they are. Remember I said 14, so three in Arabia and then 10 over here in uh, in, uh, Tarsus and Cilicia, and then one year ministry back in this Antioch, not to be confused with other Antiochs. And um, Paul was taken by Barnabas because there was lots of work and the church was growing in Antioch, and so Barnabas somehow got Paul from Tarsus, and Paul was involved for about a year in Antioch. So you put it all together and you end up with 14 years, three years in Arabia over here, Damascus and whatever other places he were, a trip to Jerusalem, 
sent to Tarsus, 10 years over here, one year in Antioch, phew, 14 years. Just pausing for effect. <laughs> okay, that was fast. So now, now we say, oh, oh good, you say, now I'm in familiar territory, right? Although maybe not all of us did have these classes or can remember all the details of the first missionary journey. So, so of course, these missionary journeys are examples where Paul is living out that conviction from 1 Corinthians 9, woe to me unless I preach the gospel. Paul can't just sit at home, right, either in Tarsus or in Antioch. No, he's got to get out there and preach the gospel, and so on the first missionary journey, we read how there were the three of them, right? There was Barnabas, the guy who introduced Paul to the apostles here in Jerusalem. And then the apostles sent Barnabas later to Antioch to help the church over here, which is why, Paul, why Barnabas could then go to, to Tarsus and bring him. So Barnabas comes from Jerusalem, had been ministering in Antioch. So Barnabas is the lead character at the beginning of the journey, and Saul, he's called. And, um, oh, they pick up a young guy along the way. So we've got two seasoned apostles, if you will, Barnabas and Saul. And then we have the young guy, John Mark. And uh, they take them out over here to the port, and they have a nice commissioning ceremony, and they sail to Cyprus, and you say, of course they go to Cyprus. Aren't you saying that? Of course they went to Cyprus because that's where Barnabas is from, right? So Barnabas comes from Cyprus. And so he not only knows the lay of the land, but he probably has family and connections that he can take advantage of. And we should reread the Gospels because some amazing stories happen here. Because when you preach the Gospel and the Holy Spirit is at work, amazing things happen. Just by the way, because I, I want to make sure I say it later on. We wrongly call this book in the Bible the Acts, what? The Acts of the Apostles. That's right. And it really isn't a good name. We should call it either the Acts of God or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because there are all kinds of ways in which Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, has shaped the story to show time and time again that the primary actor is not Paul. In fact, Paul doesn't even show up until like late in the story, right? And uh, the primary actor in Acts is not Peter or James or anyone. No, the primary actor is God or more precisely the Holy Spirit. So let me just throw that in there. So, so anyway, God is at work. The Holy Spirit is at work. The acts of the, hmm, okay, the acts of the Holy Spirit are at work. And perhaps Paul's most high-ranking convert in his whole life Right? His whole life was, I must have hit the button too hard. Sorry, hang on. There it is, right? There it is. His most important convert, he was a pro council And you could say, ooh, if you wanted to. But that's just a fancy word for governor. All right? A governor. So, like the most powerful person anywhere in the whole region. His name was Sergius Paulus. And he heard the gospel. The Holy Spirit was at work. And he became a... Jesus follower, Sergius Paulus. Well, anyway, after some things happened here on the island of Cyprus, then they sailed and they landed over here at a place called Perge. I guess you can't read it on the screen over there. And it's still visiting today. By the way, if you want to go on a biblical tour, I lead a tour to Turkey and this city of Perge is an impressive place. But something bad happened right here at Perge. John Mark said, I'm going home. <laughs> Okay, and uh, at this point, it's not a big deal in the story, but we find out later that it was a big deal. So John Mark bails on them at this point, right? And so the three musketeers of Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark become just the two of them. And they skip Perge, which is kind of unusual because it's a big city ripe for the gospel, and they do preach on it later on, and they go zoom up here to another Antioch. Not to be confused with this Antioch, Antioch of Syria, Antioch beyond Pisidia. And um, it's funny, you know, when you read Acts, it says it only in one verse. 
If you have two churches, it just says one verse. They went from Perge, they went to Antioch. If you're on a modern bus, you go over the Taurus Mountain, lots of oohs and ahs, and it takes you about almost four hours, right? I just want to remind you that the Apostle Paul, right, walking, and he'll say later on, you know, we were on the road, right? And, and many times we, we have no housing, right? We just had to sleep under the stars. And, and people rob you, even despite the Pax Romana, right? So, so uh, all those things are part of the, the, the challenges of being uh, an apostle. Goes to Antioch, some cool things happen over there. And we have uh, Iconium and Derbe, uh, uh, Lystra and Derbe. And then they backtrack, appointing elders... And then they end up back over here at the end of their first missionary journey. Phew. I wanted to pick just one story. One story uh, from the first missionary journey just to share some of the details with you. And it, it's this incident in Lystra. So first let's just hear what Acts says about it and then I'll make some comments about it. We read, in Lystra, first missionary journey, which you all know isn't the first missionary journey, right? At least it's an official journey, but he's been involved in missions certainly for a while. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and said, stand up on your feet. At that the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul, what had Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So this is just a little story among many little but important stories in the book of Acts, which is not about the Acts of the Apostles, but is about the act of God. As the gospel spreads, remember Acts begins, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and showing the spreading of the gospel, and the gospel is slowly but surely spreading. Anyway, what can we say about this story? First of all, I draw your attention to the fact that, that not once, but not twice, but three times, the, the, the Bible stresses his bad condition, like He's lame, and there's no need to say that he had been that way from birth and had never walked. <laughs> I sometimes say, you know, good speakers never say the same thing twice. Good speakers never say the same thing twice. Good speakers never say the same thing thrice. <sighs> oh, unless they want to emphasize something. And so these three different details don't add any information, but they add weight saying, you know, this guy was, he was lame. There's no question about it. it. You know, it wasn't just like a bad day and a sore foot. No, he was lame from birth. He had never, ever walked. Because, you know, the, the more lame he is, if you can understand that phrase, the more dramatic it is if he's healed, right? It's, it's more a sign of, uh, of, uh, of divine activity. And by the way, I, I should remind you that Acts, right over here in the story before, said that, that Paul and Barnabas did miracles. Why? Not just because they felt sorry for people. You know, Jesus healed a lot of people. That wasn't just because he felt sorry for him. No, the miracles are a sign of something. They point to who Jesus was. And the miracles, the same way in Paul, point to something about the gospel that he was spreading. And it says right over here, to confirm the message of God's grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. So, so Paul and Barnabas are doing miraculous signs and wonders, not to show off, not just to help out some poor people who are lame, but to confirm this gospel message that Paul felt obligated to preach. Now, as many stories in the Bible are, they are more understandable if you know the history or the culture or the social setting of that day. And it turns out that there was a rather well-known story told by Ovid and Metamorphosis. And in the story, there are two gods, Zeus and Hermes. 
And this story takes place in this region, right where Lystra is. So it happens right in this area. So especially the people in this area must have known that story. But other people are, I mean, Ovid's out in Rome. So people are telling this story all over the ancient world. But anyway, in this story, you got two gods, Zeus and Hermes. And they're in disguise, right? They, they come to earth in mortal form. And they go walking around the area of Lystra looking for people who will show them hospitality, which, by the way, is a big deal in the Middle East, right? People who welcome you, you know, into your home and food. And, and hospitality is still today is a, is a big deal. Turkish people are extremely warm and hospitable. Anyway, no one, no one shows them hospitality. They go to a thousand homes and, and no one shows them any generosity except this elderly poor couple so these two gods are understandably ticked off at all these people. And so they take this elderly couple and they bring them to a high safe place and they, uh, they send a flood and everybody below gets destroyed and then the little hut from this elderly couple gets turned into a beautiful marble temple. So this is a story that people knew in the ancient world and this story probably explains why... The people in this area treated Paul and Barnabas the way that they did. I mean, when Paul and Barnabas came and did this miracle, the people right away said, aha, I know what's going on. This is the story we heard about where we have how many gods coming down? There are lots of gods, but in this story, how many? Two, and we have two people, right? We've got Barnabas and Saul, and we've got two gods. It all works out. And oh, by the way, uh, uh, we read that 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 Paul was identified with Hermes. So, by the way, uh, I, can't, I don't think I've said this to you. In the ancient world, gods are always portrayed naked. They, this is added later, you know, under Christian things. That wasn't there originally. So, gods are always portrayed naked. By the way, that's why the Roman general, Pompey, uh, if you know about him. But anyway, Pompey, you know, made a coin and he portrayed himself on the coin as Naked, yeah. People thought it was scandalous. Not because of what you're thinking about, but for a different reason. Because, wait a minute, I just told you the only people who are portrayed naked are, are gods. And so it wasn't a very subtle attempt on Pompey to, you know, well, he wanted everyone to think of him that he was just not normal. He was a little bit above everyone. So, so anyway, so this is obviously a god. And uh, we got some signs over here. Uh, Hermes has a staff, there's the staff, and he's got not one but two snakes. There's another god with one staff around it, it's the god of healing, uh, Asclepius. But you can see these two snakes, this thing is called a cad caduceus. And then notice the wings right there, see the wings? Sometimes the wings are around his ankles right over here, because these wings allow Hermes to fly everywhere and do what his main job is. Gods have a lot of different jobs, but they usually have one main job, and Hermes' main job is to be a a messenger. So, so he goes around and he's always giving messages from the gods to different people. And so you can understand why Paul was identified with Hermes, right? Because apparently Barnabas must have been a little quieter and shy or whatever. Anyway, Paul was out there doing all the talking. And people said, aha, these two gods, I know what we're going. I've got Zeus and Hermes. And Hermes is obviously this Paul guy who's talking. Some of us pastors who are here have heard the word hermeneutics before, right? And hermeneutics comes from this god Hermes, which means to explain. Hermeneutics is the rules and guidelines of explaining the biblical text. And then notice also um, here you find this common motif in the ancient world. So here's an altar, right? This is a big altar, and on the altar they've got bulls or oxen, and they've got garland wreaths. Well, that's exactly what we had in the story, right? In the story, remember, they thought that Paul was Hermes and Barnabas was Zeus. And there was a Zeus temple right there in the city. So obviously, the, the, the Zeus priest is like, whoa, Zeus has made an appearance. And so the first thing he does is he grabs a bull, right? Put some garland wreaths about it because he's going to bring it and sacrifice it, right? That's the first thing you do in the ancient world in such a situation. So I just tell you this because uh, this is just one little story in the first missionary journey. And so often, again, when you 
know the history and the culture of that day, these stories um, take on, I think, added significance. Well, um, before I told you the story, we left Paul right, and Barnabas right over here, right? At least that's where they are in my mind. You see them, the two of them right there? Not the three of them because John Mark bailed and went to Jerusalem again where he came from, right? But the two of them, Barnabas and uh, Paul, they return and they're in this Antioch, Syrian Antioch. So after a little while, some other things happened that I'm skipping over, and the two of them said, let's go back and visit the churches we founded on our wrongly called first missionary journey, yes. And they both said yes to that, but they said no to whether or not the third person should come along with them. So Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along on the second missionary journey, and Paul said, no way, Jose. And uh, they, they were, this was a heated disagreement uh, because uh, they couldn't resolve it. And uh, ultimately, the two missionaries end up splitting. And it's a, it's, it is an interesting and a bit of a sobering thing. Those of us in ministry, right, even the most gifted of leaders, right, conflict, conflict, conflict always seems to emerge. And some of us might be even a bit embarrassed about this story because this Paul that we're talking about, he will write, for instance, to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, and the Corinthians were badly divided. And and Paul has this powerful passage about be reconciled to one another. I mean, you've been reconciled to God, now be reconciled to one another, right? And you might say, wait a minute, Paul, you're being a hypocrite, right? I mean, you're telling the Corinthians to be reconciled to one another, but what about you and... Barnabas, right? So we don't know all the dynamics uh, involved, but we do know that down the road they were reconciled because Paul speaks favorably about Barnabas to the Corinthians. And we do read later that John Mark is with Paul, uh, uh, also later on in Paul's life. So reconciliation does take place. But at this point, there's a split. So Paul, uh, sorry, Barnabas and John Mark must have made his way up the two of them go their own way and they go to Cyprus. And again, you say, of course they went to Cyprus because that's where Barnabas is from, yes. Actually, it works out a little bit better because now instead of having one missionary team, there are two missionary teams. So Paul needs somebody to go with. And so who does he connect with? He connects with a guy named Silas. Silas, who also comes from Jerusalem. And we start off, and Acts is very, very quick. We go from here to there, boom. Okay, if you read the story, boom, just like that. Oh, it does. I mean, if I mean there's a little, little hiccup over here. They pick up a third person over there. His name is, don't look down upon him, right? Because of his youth, his name is? Timothy. So, so you notice in the first missionary journey, we had two seasoned people and a younger one, and seemingly now in the second one, we have two seasoned people, different ones, Paul and Silas, and the younger guy, Timothy. And by the way, this is where Acts really shows itself being not the Acts of the Apostles, but the Acts of God or the Holy Spirit, because actually Paul wanted to go over here, probably to Ephesus. Anyway, it just says Asia or Asia Minor, and uh, it said the Spirit said no. Okay, Then Paul wanted to go up over here to Bithynia. Oh, and the Spirit said, again, no, because Paul's not in charge. God isn't above. And so instead, Paul ends up over here in a place called Troas. He he didn't intend to end up over there, but that's where God, through the Holy Spirit, directed him to go. So Acts goes foom like that really fast. And then, well, a couple of things happen right over here in Troas. Two very important things happen in Troas. The three musketeers become the four musketeers. Here is where we have the beginning of the we sections in Acts. When I say we, I mean W-E, the first person plural. You see, up to this point, it's they did this, and they did that, and Paul did this, and they did that, and then suddenly it's We did this, okay? So suddenly the author of Acts, who again is Luke, joins them. 
So that's the first interesting thing that happens here in Troas. The three musketeers get added with the fourth. Luke, the doctor, joins them. And the second very important thing, again showing that God is in control, is Paul has a dream. I'm just stopping for a minute because you do know enough from the Old Testament that dreams don't come from anyone. Dreams don't happen by accident, but they have meaning, right? And anyway, in the dream, Paul sees a Macedonian man. Macedonia is this province. Well, you can see it right over there barely. So this whole region over here is called Macedonia. And there's a man over there because there's what? Oh, I'm too heavy handed on this. Sorry. There's some water over here, right? So, so, so Paul is technically in Asia, and this is Europe over here, and he sees a Macedonian man, and the man says, come on over, yes. And then Paul wakes up from the dream, and he says, let's go to Macedonia. And then the text explicitly says, concluding that God had called us to go there. So, so I want you to understand, Paul wanted to go one way, the Holy Spirit said no. Paul wanted to go another way. The Holy Spirit said no. Paul ends up where he didn't expect to be in Troas. He has a dream sent from God. He wakes up and God's, okay. So again, one of many examples of how, how God is really controlling this whole process. And then, remember I said, Acts from here to there go foom. And then suddenly, suddenly the text slows way down. So there's this long chapter over here, right, in Philippi. Because, in a sense, Luke is saying, been there and done that, right? These are all the churches that they founded on the first missionary journey. But Luke says, we don't need to review all of that anymore, right? Just a couple of details. And, and now that the gospel is spreading, remember, the purpose of Acts is not a biography of Paul. It's not a biography of Peter. It's the spreading of the gospel, right? You'll be my witnesses from Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so now we're moving to new territory, right? We're expanding the gospel. And, and so Luke slows way down and he gives a kind of example story. You know what an example story is, right? So some things happen in Philippi and Luke assumes that the readers will say to themselves, I guess similar things like that happen later on the journey. Even if Luke doesn't tell us all of the details, stuff like this must have happened as well, right? So the first story in Philippi is quite long and then we get to Thessalonica, the second story, and it's a little shorter, right? Because we haven't got time. The book would be huge, right, if we would do everything. Now, before I continue this, I want to backtrack and just tell you one story from Philippi. Again, another story where understanding the ancient world makes the text more understandable. I alluded to it last week. I don't know if it piqued your interest. And it's the story of the python-possessed girl. Have you never heard of the python-possessed girl? They didn't tell you that one in Sunday school? So I've just picked one paragraph. This is a long narrative. I said 17 a minute ago. I should have said 16. Uh, so there's a long bunch of stories happening here in Philippi. This is just one little story. And I'll just read you the text and then we'll look at this one a little more closely. Once when we, remember the we? That's the four of them now. Not the three of them, the four of them. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. By the way, this is your English translation, a spirit by which she predicted the future. Actually, the Bible says, you know, the Greek Bible says she had a python spirit. I mean, that's what it literally says. But translators are saying, you won't understand what you mean by a python spirit. So they gave you the sense. And I'll explain it in a minute. Anyway, a spirit, a female spirit, a female slave, but a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Just three verses, really. A few comments. 
Now, you, understandably, are like, what? What's this python spirit thing? But in the ancient world, people will go, aha. Because everybody, or virtually everybody, knows what we're talking about when we talk about a, well, wait a minute, not any old snake, but a python snake, and even more particularly, a female python snake. Everyone knows the story of Delphi. There it is in, in Greece. And Delphi is not a city, it's a religious site. So people come from literally all over the world, literally all over the world to, well, to go to, to this holy site, what's left of this temple. It's the god Apollo, one of the twin gods with Artemis. Anyway, Apollo, either as a young kid or whatever, I won't give you the backstory, but he, he comes to Delphi, and at Delphi, there was a snake controlling entrance to the underground, and not any old snake, guess what kind of snake, it was a python snake, and it was a female python snake, by the way, and so the god Apollo conquers, right, this python snake, and thereby kind of controls entrance, not so much to the underground in the sense of Hades, but this part of the underground from which it was believed, right, mysterious gases would emerge and would give people the ability to predict the future. So after Apollo conquered the python, female python snake, people built a huge temple in his honor. And he was served by priestesses, by female priestesses. Well, that makes sense. Because remember, he conquered not the male python snake, he conquered a female python snake. And these female, or these pythonesses, they're called, right? They sat on a tripod. I'm looking for a stool, but okay, a tripod. And uh, there's different theories about how this went, but almost certainly it was inhaling these gases. And I'm not a scientist, but I've read enough about there's these different combinations of gases that can induce hallucinatory experiences. It can be quite dangerous, too. If you have too much of it, you can die. Anyway, people came from all over the world, and they would ask things of the oracle, the Delphic oracle, and the oracle would say, yay, nay, or give some answer. Everybody knows this. I'm going to give you at least one story about that everybody told about the Delphic Oracle because you had to be careful with the Delphic Oracle. She spoke the truth, yes, but it was a bit ambiguous. So you had to kind of interpret her truthful answer. So one very famous story is, there's the god Apollo, by the way. See, of course, he's, you know, dressed naked again, right? And he does a lot of things, right? He's into music. Uh, but anyway, he's also the god of prophecy, oracles. There he is right over there. And um, here's a story of a King Crucis. It comes from a city of Sardis. You might know Sardis. It's a modern day Turkey. It's one of the seven churches of Revelation. And this, this takes place like the 7th or 6th century BC. So this is well before New Testament times. But people in New Testament times still know this story. Anyway, King Crucis is a powerful king in Sardis. And he wanted to take on the Persians in the east. Okay, But of course, in the ancient world, you don't want to do anything without the divine approval. So before he goes to battle, he's got to get the approval of the gods. Should I go? Yes or no? How do you know what the gods want you to do? Well, you send a delegation to a place like Delphi. Right? And they're not always open for business. The oracle's only there for certain times of the year. But you stand in queue and... Uh, Maybe you have to bribe some people, but anyway, you get to ask the oracle, shall we go to battle against the Persians, yes or no? And that's what he did. Anyway, the oracle gave an answer that became very famous. The oracle said, on the day that you cross the river Halles, so between Sardis, and it's called the Lydian kingdom, between Sardis and the Lydian kingdom and the Persians in the east, there was a river, a natural border between the two, and that was called the Halles River. And the oracle says, on the day you cross the river Halles, a great army will surely be defeated. And he said to himself, aha! The oracle said, what did the oracle say? Why are you hesitant? Okay, maybe you see that, right? He said yes, okay? The oracle said yes, okay? And so he, he crosses the, the river Halles, and I won't give you all the details. It's a little bit long and complicated. People know about it, but guess what? He did ultimately destroy a great army, 
but not the army of the Persians, his own army, okay? So people like telling stories like that. Do You see, the oracle was right. He just interpreted it wrong, right? So let's get back to Philippi. Are you in your mind? Paul on his second missionary journey, the four musketeers, and wait a minute, he's out there preaching the gospel because woe to me unless I preach the gospel, and yet he's got, according to the NIV translation, which I want to get change in a minute, he's annoyed because every day there's this woman and she's got not an evil spirit, brothers and sisters. No, the Bible's quite clear. She has a python spirit, right? That's the important. Everybody says, ah, I know what a python spirit is. A python spirit is the spirit of Apollo. That it gives her the ability to predict the future. And that's what the Bible says. Her, her master's made a lot of money, right? I mean, it would be better to go to Delphi, but a lot of people can't go to Delphi, right? So, so they do the next best thing. You've got a female slave over here who can do Kind of the same thing. You got a question for the gods? You want to know yes or no for future decisions? It'll only cost you so much. And so this python-possessed woman every day is saying, these men are proclaiming to you, right? A way of salvation of the most high God. Now, remember I said to you that the interpretation of the oracle can be ambiguous. Maybe before I go, so, so every day she's saying they're proclaiming to us of the most high God. If you're a Christian, you would say this woman is telling the truth, right? I mean, because they were proclaiming the way of salvation of the most high God, right? However, that may not be what she meant, or it may have been ambiguous, and that's not what people probably would have heard. The Most High God would likely be in the ancient world, in a place like Macedonia, the province, in a place like Philippi. It would probably be the God Zeus. He's the Most High God. And so Paul is upset that this woman is misleading people, right? Because he's proclaiming the way of salvation of the Most High God, the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's got this woman every day saying something different that's confusing. And the NIV is wrong when it says that Paul was annoyed. That's not the Greek verb that Paul, that, the, that is used there, that's significant. Annoyed would be, um, I'm doing my class over here, trying hard to keep you awake and interested, and then suddenly your cell phone goes off. And then Wyman gets annoyed, okay? That, okay? That's not what's going on over here, right? The word or verb used here for annoyed is the same verb used in the Old Testament, and it describes God, how God felt when his people, the Israelites, were worshiping other gods when they were guilty of idolatry. God was not annoyed. He was distressed, <laughs> right? You understand the difference? So I don't want you to think that Paul is just kind of like ticked off because, you know, he's got a sermon going and he's working really well and then suddenly this woman's annoying him. No, 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 no. Paul is distressed because the kingdom of God that he's pronouncing with this gospel of good news is butting heads with the kingdom of the evil one, right? I mean, the evil one is at work trying to undermine the effectiveness of Paul and his gospel preaching. And then it's striking with the miracle. I just found a picture over here, right? I mean, I don't know if, you, if this is helpful or not. Like, do, what do you see over here? Do you see a young woman? You see her, her, see there's her nose and her eyes and her ear. That's a young woman, right? Or do you see an old woman? There's her mouth, right? An old nose, right? I tried to find a picture, right? It's ambiguous. Is it a young woman or an old woman? The message that this python-possessed girl was saying was ambiguous. Was she telling the truth or was she misleading? And Paul was upset, certainly by the way that she was undermining the effectiveness of his ministry. And so he... Uh, he just says something, right? There are no rituals. I mean, the, the fact that Paul can just by voice say something is, I think, revelatory of the power of the gospel that Paul is bringing, right? It's another miracle. Not a demon-possessed miracle like we read about, but a python-possessed miracle. Verifying the power of of the God that Paul was proclaiming and the veracity, the truth of the gospel 
that was part of his preaching ministry. Well, I think I got to go back to my map for a minute because we're in the middle of the second missionary journey, right? And uh, where is, it's not the three musketeers, the four of them are in Philippi. But guess what? The we section stop here. So they started here in Troas and they, they only go a little ways. So the natural conclusion is the person who was added to them, Luke, stays behind. And Luke ends up pastoring in Philippi for about seven years. Okay, so see Paul and Silas and Timothy? See, they're saying goodbye, Luke, right? Blessings on your ministry at Philippi, right? Give our regards to Lydia, right? The rich woman who's allowing her home to be used for the Christians to meet there, right? And now the three musketeers go down the Via Ignatia, the Greek Roman road to Thessalonica. And some of you may know that like I'm like the world's expert in Thessalonica. So it pains me just to say nothing about it at all. (laughs) And so they get run out of town. They go to Berea. Paul goes ahead and is brought to Athens with instructions for the two remaining folks. Silas and Timothy to join him. They join him in Athens. And after a little while, Paul says, pack your bag, boys, you're going. And they're like, what? We just got here. Paul says, no, Timothy, you got to go back to Thessalonica. Right? Silas can't go back. I can't go back because if we go back, we'll put the Christians there in trouble. And they're baby Christians. And the same people who drove us out, they're giving the Christians there a hard time. You have to go back and minister to them. And so, so, uh, so Timothy goes back. Uh, we don't know exactly where Silas went. He went somewhere up here, whether to Philippi, but maybe he didn't need to because Luke was there. Maybe he went to Berea. Maybe he went somewhere else. But the two of them are there, and Paul is all by myself. I'm sitting in the Acropolis in Athens all by myself. He's a little while by himself. But then he moves on. The Spirit drives him to Corinth. And he's there for a long time, a year and a half, a year and a half, a year and a half. Did you hear me say that? A year and a half, long time. And during that time, the two brothers in the north, remember Timothy was sent to Thessalonica, Silas, some over here, they come down to Paul in Corinth. And they bring him some good news and they bring him some money. After a year and a half, Paul sails across with Priscilla and Aquila and seemingly with his two cohorts. He lands at Ephesus. They say, stay. Paul says, I would love to, but only if God allows. I've got to keep going. So Paul keeps going down to Jerusalem, up to Antioch. Phew. The end of the so-called second missionary journey. Ten minutes left, less, if I want to have a question or two. Are you ready to start the third missionary journey? Why not? Okay. Well, just hold on for the question, okay, if we can't. Okay, give it. I just wonder why Paul would wait for day after day with this Python spirit doing that and not put a stop to it immediately. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, uh, there are lots of good questions that the Bible doesn't answer. But all the important questions the Bible does answer. I like what the the Belgic Confession says. All that is needed, that's a good verb, isn't it? I mean, not all that we'd want. All that is for two things, for God to be glorified and for us to be saved. Anyway, so the third missionary journey, there they, I got to go to the right slide. Okay, go ahead here. And all the good stuff that I'm skipping over Thessalonica. Oh, the pain of it all. Oh, well. Here we go, the third missionary journey. So, so they start off over here, and this time the Spirit does allow Paul to go to Ephesus. And Paul is there longest of any stay that we know of, two, two years and uh, three months. Two years and three months, he's in Ephesus. And the whole of Asia hears the gospel some of you know, right, That's, there was that big riot in Ephesus, and one of the city leaders says, don't you know this Paul is leading astray everyone in Asia? It sounds like an exaggeration, but clearly Paul and his missionaries, his helpers are, 
Ephesus is the third or fourth largest city in the ancient world. So it's a very important city and it's like the home base for the gospel going through this whole region. But after two years and three months, Paul leaves. I might just quickly say he's, he's collecting money along this way. Collecting money from his Gentile churches. And the churches are giving money and people. So he's got a little entourage that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Paul was eager to hear from Titus. Why? Because Paul had sent a very, a very nasty letter. He had to because things were so bad in Corinth. He had to send a nasty letter with Titus. And so Paul was eager to hear from Titus. But anyway, so Paul couldn't wait anymore. He was waiting for Titus about the Corinthians. So he went up north to Troas. Still no sign of Titus. Crosses over to Philippi. Says hi to Pastor Luke and Lydia and Thessalonica, Berea, all the Christians. Somewhere over here he meets up with the returning Titus. And Paul is so excited because the Corinthians seemingly have had a change of heart. The Holy Spirit has been at work. Paul ultimately makes his way down to Corinth and stays for three months, probably waiting because of the winter time. Notice how Paul goes from the east to the west by land and then from the west to the east by sea because the prevailing winds are this way and you don't want to sail in the winter season. So he's waiting for three months for the season to improve and just before he sails, he hears about a threat against his life and, and so instead they backtrack. So he, he backtracks. Are you with me? A third missionary journey. He backtracks. He picks up Luke. Luke joins him. The we sections start exactly where they left off. On the second missionary journey, on the return leg of the third missionary, Luke, Luke joins them. And Paul keeps going. Some other interesting things I haven't got time or I don't have time to say. They come and, and they land. And Paul brings that offering. And that's when Paul is arrested and some other things happen to him. I'm just going to put the slide over here. Fourth missionary journey with a question mark in case someone wants to ask me about it. But I don't want to be too long. And so let's see if there's a comment or question about anything I've said so far. Or maybe about the fourth missionary journey that we can squeeze in before we have to end our time together. Don't be shy. We don't have a lot of time. No one can see who you are anyway. Just say it. Wasn't there something about Paul going to Spain at some point? Okay, very good. So... Why do we, it's related to this particular question, the fourth missionary journey. We do know at the end of Romans, at the end of Romans, Paul wants to go to Spain. And it looks like, just like, if I would go back here, just like this Antioch was kind of the home or sending church for this part of Paul's missionary activity. If I could go a little further, Rome's over here. Paul was looking for Rome seemingly to be the home base for, because Spain's either further west, to be the home base for that part of his ministry. So we know for sure that Paul wanted to go to Spain. And the question is, did he get to do it? And there are a variety of, of later sources that say yes. All right. Let me just quickly say that, um, well, we have over here, well, I guess I could say this too. Paul says to Titus, I left you on the island of Crete. So I don't know if we can see it on the map over here. Oh, there it is. There's the island of Crete right over there. Nowhere on the first, second, or third missionary journeys has Paul ever been on Crete. So how could Paul leave Titus on the island of Crete if he had never been there? So, so that's at least some evidence that after Paul was arrested... And remember last week, those of you who were here, this is your chance to shine. Paul could reach into his pocket and pull out, there were two cards, right? The, what was one of the cards he could pull out? Not his apostleship card. That won't help him with the Roman authorities, but his citizenship card, okay? There's lots of evidence that important people, Roman citizens, they were instead of summarily killed, they were exiled, exiled. It's very common for people to be exiled for a period of time. And so uh, there is good reason to believe that Paul met before the emperor finally, uh, Nero, and because of his status, he has said, bad boy, you know, we're gonna send you over here, don't do that any again. But wait a minute, the very first slide I showed you is important. Woe to me unless I preach the gospel. 
And, and he not only wanted to go to Spain, but we have later writers like um, Clement of Rome. Look at his date. It's right close to the time of Paul. After he had been seven times in chain, had been driven into... Did you see it? Don't miss it. What's the word? Exile. So, so there's further evidence. So this is an early Christian who says that. And had been stoned and had preached in the east and the... West, so that seems to suggest. Here we have this document. You can forget about it, but just it has a line in there. The departure of Paul from the city is Rome when he journeyed to Spain. And we have another Christian writer by the name of Eusebius. Now it's a little bit later. And after Paul had pleaded his case in Rome the first time, Paul is said to have been sent again on the ministry of preaching. And after a second visit to the city of Rome, he finished his life with martyrdom. So he not only wanted to go to Spain, there are some texts and historical evidence that say that after his first two-year, not imprisonment, his two-year restriction, or whatever, house arrest in Rome, he was banished, said, don't do that anymore, don't disturb the peace, but woe to me unless I preach the gospel. He engages in preaching on the gospel, goes to places like Crete and Spain and so forth, and ultimately gets into trouble and and then is rearrested and retried. And this time he pulls out his citizenship card. It doesn't help him, right? Because no, you, you already did that once. You can't do that twice. And the traditions are quite clear that he is led outside the city wall of Rome. Outside the city wall, right? Because you don't bury people in the city in the ancient world. You also do it outside. So why kill him and then have to move him? So we take him outside the city wall and then we behead him. Does that sound good? It's better than crucifixion. Okay, so, I mean, that makes sense. Peter was crucified because he wasn't a Roman citizen. He couldn't pull out that card, right? At least beheading is at least quick and an honorable way to die. Anyway, the spot where he supposedly was killed, now there's a church there. And you can visit if you do a trip with me to Italy. And the church, of course, is called the, the what is it called again? It's something like the Church of Paul Outside the Wall Church. <laughs> Not a very user-friendly name, but okay, it's, that's outside the wall. It makes sense, exactly the story that I told you. So another question or comment about Paul the missionary. Oh, one last slide just to impress you. There it is right over here. So here's a really good, he's a German. Germans do good scholarship, so he's a good guy anyway. But look at the bottom. This is a bit of an estimate, but he kind of tracked all the miles by land, all the miles by sea, all the miles that Paul traveled, right? And you can look at that. 15 and a half thousand miles. 15 and a half thousand miles. Because woe to me unless I preach the gospel. Well, thank you for your time and attention. I'd like to close in prayer. Invite you to come next week because next week is Paul the letter writer. As impressive as he is for his travels and his endurance and passion for preaching the gospel, his writing ability is also of some significance. And I think it's important if you want to interpret not just Philema, but any of Paul's letters. But can I ask you to stand? And we'll have our closing prayer. And then if you want to have a question still, I'll stick around and be happy to talk with you. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gospel, this message, not just any old message, but the most important message of all that you've entrusted into our care. And we pray that we may not be selfish with it, Yes, oh God, we pray that that message may be our story and by the help of your Holy Spirit, we may live it out in our own life, but we also pray that it may be a story shared with those around us. And so as we leave this place and we begin this new week and as we perhaps go to our job site, as we interact with people in our neighborhood, as we maybe have contact with a family member who does not have a commitment to Christ, we pray that we too may have a sense of woe if we do not, if not preach, but share the good news of the gospel and help us to realize that like Paul, we are not alone, but that your spirit is at work in and through us. So empower us to be faithful 
ministers of the gospel, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.